live, you are live. Good morning to the Sunrise Ferry. Oh, spider webs everywhere. Uh, welcome, my name is Brett Joe Smith. I have Jean Dre on camera. We have Jamie and Vim out in the other vehicle, and we have Geraldine and Louise in final control. And it is setting up to be an absolutely spectacular morning. Uh, the clouds rolling past the eastern horizon at the moment. I'm in the area where we had shadow stalking Impala last night. And the Impala is still there, so maybe she gave up. Jamie is checking for Karula. And we are hoping for leopards all over the place this morning. Now, it is a particularly chilly morning for me, even though it is only 20 degrees Celsius, which is like 78 Fahrenheit. But uh, I've already started getting ready for winter, thinking about finding my gloves and such and such. But it is going to be a beautiful morning. And we're gonna just do a big loop while it's dark around Impala Plains, Impala Road. And uh, once it gets light, we're gonna check our western boundary, see if Shadow might have managed to sneak across there. I haven't seen any tracks yet, so it's possible she's still in this block to the east of us here. So, fingers crossed. I definitely wanna have a good look at Shadow, see if we can see definite suckle marks. All right. Call me a pessimist, but until I see suckle marks or I see a cub, I don't believe. So it'll be interesting to see if we can find her this morning. Now, the one joy about a spotlight, it's like a mobile heater. Maybe I should hold my hands on it like this and drive with my legs. This road we're on now is pretty much the boundary between Shadow and her mom, Karula. So it could be either a leopard in this area. Now the Karula we know has cubs. Shadow, there's been reports of cubs so far and she's behaving like she's got cubs. But until we can see definite suckle marks or a cub itself, I am going to uh, on the side of caution, as anywhere, rumors can fly and burn through an area at the speed uncomparable, like a hurricane through the Saudi sands when it comes to rumors of lion and leopard cubs. So I, as I said, I'd rather be a little bit pessimistic and wait till I can confirm myself. Now, it did look like Shadow had a wound on her stomach. And I'd also like to see that and check on it. Well, we have a comment from one of our new viewers, a new member to the Safari Live family. Is that what I think it is, Jean-Dre? You see that there? I think I found, is it? It is. Stand by guys. I'm just gonna put this spotlight somewhere in the general area. And balance it while I go double check. Make sure I'm not fibbing to you. So let's go have a look what that is. And uh, hopefully it's something I can bring closer to show you. Side face. Um, it is something, but it's not something I'm going to disturb. I initially thought it might be a really small chameleon, but it's not. It's a, it's an African vagrant butterfly that's sleeping there, and they do sometimes confuse us and look a little bit like chameleons, but not this case. So we're going to find my ears. Oh, bah! I think I've got my ears now. 
and there's the moon that is setting at the moment. But I've got my ears now, so we're going to carry on. See if we can find any track or sign of this female leopard. So, just check carefully here. Aaron in New Zealand would like to know whether I'm going to try to find the side stripe jackals today. Oh, Aaron, I'm not sure yet. Let's see what's happening on Juma first. And then maybe we will head off towards the southern edge of the Arethusa airstrip. They might be there or they might have moved off. You never know. So I think I'm going to concentrate on leopard for now. But if we don't find any leopard, we definitely might take a little meander down towards the southern end of the Arethusa airstrip. So while we continue to search for shadow, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. As Brent has already updated you, we will be searching not necessarily for Karula herself, but just my aim of this morning is to try and figure out where exactly she's decided to den. So last night, when we had her, she was quite full-bellied, in my opinion. It was a very brief sighting and it was a very tricky sighting because she kept moving through the bushes. But I'm fairly certain that she had quite a full belly. And when she walked past an entire herd of Impala and I switched off all my lights, my impression was that her interest in them was almost academic. So in other words, being the opportunist that leopards are, and I don't think she was actually interested from a I'm hungry kind of point of view. I think she was moving through the area and I want to see if I can figure out, not necessarily to find her, although that would be an ideal bonus, but just to figure out where she's keeping those cubs now. Because to be completely honest, we have what we think is a rough idea but we really don't know. And it would be nice to know, just in terms of whenever we go tracking anything, whenever we go for a walk in a drainage line and where to avoid with our vehicles. Just so that we've got a, oh, oh, I forgot about this patch of road. Vuba Road is no more where Vuba Road used to be. The elephants have seen to that. They've quite casually created a pan in the middle of the road. Sandra, me too. I also really hope that we see those leopards again. Sandra's watching on YouTube. That was such an amazing coincidence that Brent and myself found two leopards within what it must have been about the space of a 30 seconds, 45 seconds of each other. That being said, I think that yesterday morning, Karula watched me drive past her three times, maybe four times. I was trying to, I spent the whole, mo the whole afternoon trying to figure out exactly where she'd gone off the road. And I think I picked the wrong direction <laughs> or the wrong side of the road. And I'm, I'm, I'm positive. She watched me drive past, watched Dave and myself drive past. The thing is, after all this rain, vegetation is so dense that you can barely see more than 10 meters into the bush. Not that we're complaining, because it is wonderful to see. It's not going to last for very long, but it is wonderful to see for now. But it does make tracking leopards somewhat tricky. Stop for one moment. We can have a look at the sky for now. Isn't that the most extraordinary light you've seen in a while? We've had so many special sunrises and sunsets recently. I just wanted to listen to the guinea fowl calling but they are not alarm calling, they're just doing their general morning call.
Hold on a moment. Earpiece out. There are lines calling very, very far away. I can hear them off to the south. Oof, bird noise is positively deafening. That's maybe not the best description, but get rid of the spider web that was on the camera. So noisy this morning. Okay. I can pop my earpiece back in. I just wanted to try and figure out exactly how far away those leopard calls, oh sorry, those lion calls were. But going back to the subject of leopards, Aqua would like to know who is bigger, Mvula or the Anderson male? Aqua, I've never seen the Anderson male, but I have heard that he is one of the biggest leopards that has ever graced the property of the Sabi Sands. Close to, if not more than, uh, I'm going off what Brent and James and Scott and the other guides have said about him, that he is close, uh, well over 100 kilograms after a good meal, which puts him over 200 plus pounds. So he is most definitely the larger of the two. Vula, whilst he was a beautiful male leopard, and he still is a beautiful male leopard, to me is not all that large. I've only had a couple of sightings with him. He's an exceptionally good looking leopard, but I would not have said that he was anywhere as close to as large as the Anderson male. And I mean, to be fair, the Anderson male is absolutely the exception to the rule. Now, Vula, while he's, now that he is starting to age, is actually far smaller than both the Anderson male and Tingana. Tingana is all head and shoulders. He's got quite a skinny rear end, but he has very powerful forequarters. So that would be my summation of the lip in order. The Anderson male, in order of the ones that we are most likely to see of a mature age. The Anderson male, Tingana and then Mvula. I'm not sure where Gijima falls in that particular ranking in terms of size. I think, though, it is very telling that Mvula decided to cross into Simbabili. The reason I say that is that is so far beyond his usual territorial movements. And it suggests to me that he is running a bit scared of Gijima. That he's moved that far west. Look how empty Boyatella Dam is looking already. Just to give you a rough idea. Oh, Donna, apparently I re referred recently to a female running fast in terms of looking at the tracks and you were wondering how on earth I know that. Donna, when it gets a little bit lighter, I'll be able to explain to you with diagrams, but essentially for any of the cat species, when their feet register, so when the back foot falls on top of the front foot, that's a relatively slow speed. The further in front of the front track, the back track moves, the faster that animal is walking. And when they start to run, you quite often get the tiniest imprint of the claw. Either way, you can see the stride changing completely. So that is how I know the difference between a slow walking cat and a rapidly moving cat. For other animals, something like an antelope, they tend to dig deeper into the soil as they run. So it very much depends on what it is. I, I don't have to be completely honest, I can't remember what I was referring to in that particular respect. Somewhere around quarantine, there's also a ground hornball calling. An oriole, black-headed oriole. It's a bit dark for us to be finding them. 
and I'm actually quite, to be completely honest, I'm quite blindsided by the presence of the clouds. That is not something I was expecting. I thought we were going to have a crisp and clear autumn morning. amazing is that? Dawn is watching Safari Live in a plane from 35,000 feet above ground level on her way to Chicago. That's amazing Dawn. Oh sorry, on her way to Europe. That's incredible. What a way to pass the flight time. Definitely to me the best way to approach a long distance flight. We're right at that time of the morning where the spotlight is no longer a help but a hindrance. And we'll pop that down. So Dawn, watching all the way on the plane at 35,000 feet, that you are roughly the height, almost, you're a little bit higher, but you are almost roughly the height of the highest recorded flying bird, or one of the highest recorded flying birds. The vultures, and in particular the, oh, hold on, the Rupel's vulture, or Rupel's griffin, is capable of reaching up to 32,000 feet, or has been recorded to reach 32,000 feet. Something that we might encounter on this reserve, probably a little bit unlikely though, I would be very surprised. Nevertheless, all of our vulture species are capable of reaching such enormous heights above the ground. And that's one of the amazing things about birds, because it is, first of all, the oxygen layer is, or the oxygen concentration is particularly thin at that altitude. And obviously, whilst Dawn is flying, her cabin is pressurized, rather than the incredibly low pressures at that height. And then you've got the cold all of which our planes are built to insulate us from, but for birds, they have the feather lining. They also have breathing sacs within their body cavities, so an extension of their lungs, essentially, with oxygen sacs around them, allows them to maintain the incredibly high energy process of flight at those sorts of heights. My guess, I want to just slowly move around here. My guess is that Karula came south from her position. But I don't really know specifically why I say that. It's a guess more than anything else. I almost immediately stopped following her last night. As soon as she disappeared from view. I let her get on with her nightly business of hunting, opportunistically hunting and moving through the area. I haven't picked up on any of her tracks but driving around in the dark is a good chance that she moved through here without me picking up on them. Debbie. Debbie's watching and would like to have an update on the various lion movements from around the area. Ooh, it's actually quite chilly. Debbie, the Birmingham's, most of the Birmingham boys were seen to the east of the Mulwanini <laughs> yesterday afternoon to give you a better description of where that is and I promise you it's somewhere that you're going to get relatively familiar with in a very short space of time once we start traversing Cheetah Plains. It is the drainage line equivalent, so the creek or river system equivalent of the Mulwati drainage line, just that little bit further to the east on Gauri Main. So it's the, the drainage line system that flows through Torchwood. And that is where some of them were seen. Brent had a, one of them on the Buffalo Kill yesterday. Amazing that they are still, or that at least one of them is still feeding off the Buffalo Kill. 
on Arethusa, or was yesterday afternoon. I'm assuming he's decided to move off by now. And then Nkuhumas, Nkuhumas are a bit of a mystery to me, to be completely honest. They're a bit of a mystery to everyone. Last tracks wandered into Arethusa, but that was days ago. I'm guessing they might have moved west, but that is a guess. I honestly don't know where they were. And last sighting of the six females was around the Kugauri on their way moving to the east. So that's the update on them. All three sticks are still together, so the female hasn't, the most pregnant female hasn't gone off to go give birth. The Nkuhumas are cryptic at the moment, if I could describe them like that. And the Birmingham boys are split up in various directions to the south and to the west of us. And that's my lion update for the morning. Let's find out how Brent's morning is going. So unfortunately we've had no luck with the tracks just yet. So what Jandre and I are going to do is head towards the western boundary called Triple M North and see. Hopefully she hasn't crossed. Hopefully she still is in that block where we last saw her last night. And hopefully we'll, we'll either hear some alarm calls or find some fresh tracks, which will actually give us an idea of where she might be. Seems to be getting colder this morning as we continue on, so I've rolled it down my sleeves. Uh, trying to button them up, and of course this is taking quite a lot of um, dexterity while driving. Hello, old men. Oh, not so happy to see us this morning. Some old buffalo balls. Now we're right on one of the highest points of Juma. And as it starts to get colder, these old buffalo bulls in the evenings will move up to these crests and enjoy the slightly warmer temperature that happens here for a, a bit after dark uh, due to the fact that warm air rises. So they'll move out of the dry riverbeds and from the pans and come steep up on top of the crests. Nice old boys, but they don't seem too happy to see us this morning. Moving off into the thicket, so we're going to continue our search for a female leopard. Evie in Long Island is wondering what is the coldest temperature we get uh, here? Well, and have we ever said, seen snow? Evie, I think the last time it snowed in the Sabi Sands was probably a millennia ago, even longer, but we don't really get uh, snow in this part of the world. And in the last 10 or so years, I've only ever seen frost once. So not, not a, not a, common place here but on average during the middle of winter we can probably work on about four degrees celsius in the early morning now with with the uh, wind chill factor it works out to about zero celsius but um, four degrees celsius in fahrenheit is uh, about 39 and that's only really in the very early morning but it quickly work, works, it way, works its way up uh, to during the day about 30 degrees Celsius and uh, that is I think if I remember correctly around 86 Fahrenheit 86 to 87 Fahrenheit but um, we can get down as low as about zero or minus one Celsius, which is uh, 32, I think zero is 32, 32 
uh, Fahrenheit. So it does get a little bit chilly, but the main factor of why it feels so cold is because we are in open vehicles. So while we're driving, it's the wind chill factor, which makes it feel much colder. You say you and me both, I'd really like to find Shadow to have a look at that wound again. I didn't have a good look at it because she was hunting last night. We didn't keep the light on her for very long. So it would be very interesting to have a look at that wound. Uh, it might not even be a wound. I just saw blood on her stomach. So maybe she killed something small. And now we're going to check the western boundary and see if she maybe crossed okay so apparently we've got a bit of a problem with our audio so while we try to fix that let's see if we can go back to Jamie so we're going to jump back on with Jamie while we try to fix this weird in our audio. Of where Karula did to move off to last night, I'm trying to work out which particular drainage line she might have moved her cubs to. And just all I want to see is her track. Not necessarily seeking, actively seeking her out, but it would be really nice to know. Um, we had a discussion as guides about the possibility of her denning around the tree house the tree house dam to the house if we could call it that the Mulwati. So audio fixed, we're back and We'll be going to be checking very carefully and very slowly along this road. It is one of the main access roads in the Sabi Sand, so it does get a little bit of traffic. But hopefully we're early enough to meet, beat most of the traffic so we can still see tracks nicely. Andre is whistling at me, which means he's seen tracks somewhere. He says it's a leopard track, but is it a hyena? This is a hyena going that way. Oh, we'll check now, Andre. We will check now. And Chandra is correct, and it does look like Madam Shadow. So there is leopard tracks here. There are leopard, is leopard tracks. What horrific English there is. So there we go, walking down the edge of the road. So there are hyena tracks, but the one on the right is the leopard. So in this low light, it is quite difficult to see, so well spotted Chandra. We're going to be turning around because it looks like she gave up on those impala. Oh, that's a big bump. Now, where has she crossed? Or if she has. So I do apologize, my head is going to be hanging over the door quite a bit. I don't want to miss where she crosses. Let me just get onto the Arethusa channel. A nice, very set of tracks. She came and sent marked on this tree. Look where did she, there she went. Uh, morning mobile stations, is anyone copying me? Bye your breath, though. When well, he said, uh, I've got tracks of shadow from where we had her last night heading south down triple m north uh, quite close to the impala plains junction we're just to the ooh, north of that at the moment but tracks here sorry heading south down uh, gary uh, triple m north 
Copy, carry on following. Um, I'm on my fifth one here and coming up to Red Dam. I'll just look here. If I see anything, I'll give you a shot. But yeah, land the first thing. Copy, thanks very much. So there we go. We've still got the trucks. It is, as I said, quite a, a busy road. So sometimes it is quite difficult to follow her. And I haven't had a... Is that her or is that a hyena? That is a hyena. Let's just check. She maybe did a sneaky puff at a manoeuvre from those nice last set of nice tracks that we saw. Yeah. Shadow, Shadow, where art thou? We did see some nice tracks around. Yeah, there we go. There's a nice clear track. There's the last clear track. Let me just jump out of the vehicle quickly just to make sure I don't miss anything. And doing our little bit as well. We found a bit of Stuff that's not supposed to be here. Obviously, looks like this has fallen off a, a spare wheel with the bolts that holds the spare wheel in back. Always good to have a few spare bolts. I know the Wildebeest would like one, or two, or three, or five. So the last very clear track was just over there. Walked onto this very hard patch. So I'm just going to wander here a little bit and see if I can see either where she's crossed onto this and maybe gone into Arethusa or whether she's just wandered down this very hard, smooth, graded section. Sometimes it's always good to change the angle, look back uh, if you're a little bit unsure. So it always helps when there's a bit of light, so using the headlights here, Here we go, very faint, but there are tracks there. And here we go, this is the spot. So, so faint, you can barely see them. That's definitely her going this way. Okay, let's carry on. Oh, sneaky, she just went for a set mark and now she's back. Walking on this really hard area. That's why we often get out of the vehicle to see tracks. So even though our heads are hanging off the side, it is very difficult when you're driving to see tracks that are on slightly hard substrate. But there we go, we found where she is now. And she's continuing on. I'm not even going to attempt to show you the tracks. They're almost impossible to see. We can try. So, and can you get where my foot scraped there, John? Oh no, I'm too close. Sorry, that was my fault. Okay, now, let me just wait for Jean-Ray to zoom in and I'll try. So, okay, where's my finger? That is hyena. Now there is the faintest impression of a leopard track. So that's what I'm looking for. It's not even a full track because she's walking on very hard ground. But we are on the right track. Ha 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 ha. I'm so funny this morning. But I am going to still be going extremely slowly. 
to make sure I don't miss the tracks. It's amazing, just this little bit of extra height we are now, and I find them so much more difficult to see than when I'm walking. And one of the greatest challenges about tracking down this particular area is what well, we've got lots of traffic, like this vehicle coming up towards us now. Okay, there's another track there. And all we need is one person to drive in the slightly wrong spot. And goodbye, track. And she done another runner on me. It, what happens is quite often when a female leopard is walking or a male leopard is walking down the road like this, and she'll often zig off, scent mark against the bush, and then come back. Pay sometimes to check a little bit further. Here is an example of it actually almost small scent mark. So there you can see she's walked dip, 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 up to the bush. She would have turned her tail, sprayed urine, and then carried on. Slum end roll here. Parallel road, north of, not fourth and open. Okay, so now she's decided not to walk on the very edge of the road. She's walking in the centre of the road. Now that, of course, is a problem with the amount of vehicles that traverse up and down. We're just going to have to go very slowly again. Now, where I'm expecting to find tracks, so if you know leopards and you think about a leopard, I'm guessing she might scent mark that bush. So even if I don't have tracks in this section, I'm going to go and check right there because that looks like a good spot for a leopard to scent mark. So quite often with tracking, you've got two very different types of tracking. Uh, you've got to either go track to track to track or you must try and think like a leopard so i'm going with the faster version of go then going track to track we can always come back and do track to track to track if we don't find any tracks up ahead mm, let's just keep going for a little bit slowly while you're tracking. John Jandre, anything your side? She might have meandered to the other side. And it, it is great having cameramen who can differentiate a leopard from a hyena track. And we can thank Jandre, we even have tracks to follow. She's walking on this very hard surface that's been graded on the edge of the road again. So, let's keep my eyes peeled. There we go, thank you, Jandre. So she's walking on the other side of the road at the moment. So Bud, he's in North Carolina. He has a trouble picturing these big cats moving great distances while they have cubs. Can't picture Karula moving so far and so quickly with cubs. Is she keeping them in a den? Yes, but uh, she will leave them in a, in a den for quite a while until uh, they're about a year old. 
and even then she still might leave them in an area rather than a den. Make sure it's a good area with nice trees or thickets for them to hide in. But that's how she's able to traverse and hunt because if you have a cub with you, it can make life quite difficult for hunting. Okay, so I haven't seen the last tracks we had on that side. Maybe she's zagged instead of zigged. She's gone back into a juma. We're going to keep going. There's a, a, a road coming up and a lot of leopards, especially when there's a lot of dew around, like this morning. And that she's back. And she's come to scent mark this bush. Or did she carry on straight past there? Yeah, she's carrying on. Walking on the hard soils. But bud, they will leave them in the den and sometimes they'll leave them alone in the den for up to three or four days, just depending on the age. On average, they never leave them for more than two days, but I have seen a female leopard leave cubs for, you know, I think it was about five days, five nights in total. Every now and then I'm just getting a nice track uh, off and on the hard stuff. Now this is really exciting. I mean, we're tracking a female leopard live on safari in South Africa. I do, for, do forgive me for not looking up too often. I really want to make sure we don't miss where her tracks might cut off the road. Yeah, we're coming up to the next road junction. So this is one of the routes she likes to take, so let's have a careful check here. I'm going to jump out of the vehicle again. See if she's headed into Arethusa or she's kept on going down Triple M. good as well to just listen for a bit so while we stop the vehicle and I'm checking for tracks my ears are working overtime to try and hear anything so nothing there just yet down the road. Maybe she came this side. So we've got no tracks here. That doesn't mean she hasn't walked yet. It could mean a vehicle has driven over her tracks. So we're going to check further on and only if we don't find tracks further on will we go back to the last set of tracks.
so tracking has been described by as an art and I'm concentrating quite heavily at the moment uh, not only with my eyes with my ears as well anything your side there Jandre? Okay, we're going to go as far as that tree there to double check for tracks. If nothing, we'll go back to the last track. Oh. And while you're tracking leopards, ah, there we go. Giant, land snail, and shadows tracks all in one. So, there's the land snail. It's a big one. Slowly mounting the side of the road. But that's not what we're after this morning. We're on hot on the trail of a female leopard and her tracks are going to come into frame. There they are. So let's keep on them. So she's not walking on the side, she's walking in the almost centre of the road. Unfortunately, it is where vehicles drive. But so far, our luck is holding. No one has driven over them too much that I can't see them. Still there. Oh, and gone. She just sneak off the road. Okay, so. and we've got her again here. Oh dear. This is, as I said, one of the bigger pro big problems with tracking leopards down main access roads. So I've still got tracks here. Is that there are a lot of vehicles. Oh, and it's Michael, young Michael from from Cheetah Plans, is, is, are you going on leave, young Michael? I'm going on leave. Oh no, good riddance then. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope <laughs> we don't see you soon. Yeah, no, no Jack, enjoy your leave. Good luck, yeah, no worries. You see anything on your I trip from the lodge? No, no but I'm still coming to the lodge. I'm also not talking to him. I'm 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 not talking to him. Well, there we go, guys. Quarantine. One of a lot of your favorite leopards was seen last night on, on Cheetah Plains. Well, Mike, enjoy right. your leave. No problem. Don't get into too much trouble with all those young ladies out there now. Won't do. Cheers. Okay. Oh, isn't that nice? Young Michael doesn't to drive over Shadow's tracks either. All of a sudden, ah, that is why all of a sudden the tracks disappear because they have been driven over. So, when tracks have been driven over, I have to look even more carefully. But so far, so good. She's not making it too difficult for us just yet. Now, Deanna was wondering, could she be in a tree? Well, 
There's a great misconception that leopards spend an inordinate amount of time in trees. They don't. Most of the time they're on the ground. The only time leopards really utilize trees is when they have a kill to hoist or if it's a particularly hot and uh, they try and get up there where there's a little bit more breeze and to get away not only from the heat but also from the biting flies. And the other third option for using a tree is to get away from a potential threat when they're being chased by something. And Clown Sharon is wondering how long leopard scent marks can last for if it hasn't been raining. Well, Sharon, it depends completely, and Sharon would also like to know, can it be smelt by humans? Yes, it can, and it has the most wonderful smell of buttered popcorn. But when you smell that, it's generally very fresh, so within the last sort of half an hour, 45 minutes. So I can't smell these yet, but if I do start smelling them, then we can start getting excited. It means we are very close on Madame Shadow's tail. Okay, we still got tracks. She is really marching the Triple M boundary at the moment. Well, thank you, Anna Marie, for your faith in me. Anna Marie says, her gut says, I'm going to find the female leopard this morning. She just knows it. Well, thanks for your vote of confidence, Anna Marie. I will try my best. Your side, John Jones, nothing. Maybe she's gone back onto this hard, graded surface. She has. She might cross across to your side there. Jump, jump, driven over. So let's look a bit beyond. She's on the hard surface again. So let's give you guys a bit of homework while I'm looking for this leopard. Uh, while I'm looking for this leopard, let's give you guys some homework. Jandre, actually you guys decide what type of quiz would you like? Would you like a mammal quiz, a reptile quiz, a tree quiz, a flower quiz? You guys let me know and let me know what type of quiz you would like to do while my head is peering over the void that is the side of the Land of Rover looking for shadows tracks. And you can let us know what type of quiz you'd like to do by popping us an email on questions at wildearth.tv or using the hashtag safari live on twitter now there is a reason what you've been with me so long uh, jamie has had another explosion of gremlins uh, the tech department are with her trying to figure out how to exterminate them Oh, I haven't seen tracks for a while now. I'm trying to check up ahead with her some soft sand there. And there she's. Ah, right, there she is. She's veered back into the center of the road. The tracks have been half driven over. I'm John Day, just spot her in the red so I can stop staring at the ground. Okay, so her tracks were being driven over and she's, her tracks have now been definitely driven over. But general direction is still due south almost.
your side, Jandre. And sorry, I missed the name, but someone said they love the fact that our cameramen can track nearly as well as we can. We do too. It is a massive benefit to be able to have another set of eyes. You can check that side of the vehicle for us. Roger. Linda, sorry, Linda in Virginia. Oh, thanks, Linda. I'm sure the cameramen do appreciate a little bit of recognition for their tracking skills. Here we go. Now, I haven't seen a truck for a while. As I said, since we've been here, we've had two vehicles. So they could have driven over, unless there they are. Yep. Here we are. We're in the center of the road now. I can't see them again, but there are car tracks there. Uh, now the trick is to make sure we spot them if they cross out when we can't see them there. We continue to track. Uh, it seems like Jamie has beaten off some of her gremlins. So let's go see what she's been up to. Look at this spectacular elephant bull that is moving away from us at the moment. I'm going to try and get you a better view rather than a grey shape and disappearing off into the bush. He is a stunningly large male. I'm hoping that we might be able to follow up. Mm. Let's go towards the fire break and just see. He's, he's definitely moving fairly quickly. Now, we've spoken a lot about the drought and the fact that it has thrown things into something of a confusion. And that includes the elephants of this area. So some of them have come in from the western side of Kruger. And it's a huge space. I mean, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's something like 2% of the Kruger National Park is drivable by the average visitor. So somebody moving, so somebody coming along the tourist roads. There's a chance that the elephant bulls are coming in from an area where they haven't been all that familiar with vehicles, which I think might be the case with this gentleman. Where did he go? I wouldn't think it would be that easy to lose a four-ton elephant, five-ton elephant. There's 10,000 odd pounds of animal moving in this area. Here he goes. Oh boy. Don't go that way. Sorry, let me try and find a clearer view. I am on my way to the hyena den. It seems as though we are a bit restricted to good signal areas. Wendy has been attacked by gremlins once again. There you go, Kimba. You've been missing November and would love to go to the hyena den. And I know recently I've only gone during the sunset safaris. It'd be nice to go in the morning. And it's nice and cool this morning, so there's a good chance they'll be out and about. He's going to push over this ruler tree. Hello, boy. Jimmy, spectacular. Stop here. He's a bit unsettled. He's just keeping an eye on us out of the corner of his eye. That body language looking back over his shoulder. And this, just gauging by our rear view, the size of his tusks, 
as well as how prominent his spine is, I would say we're looking at a relatively old elephant. 35 years or older. In fact, I would probably guess 40 plus. And once they get older, their skin starts to lose elasticity. And their skeletal structure becomes more visible. It's most clearly visible in the head where the skin starts to collapse in around the temporal regions. He's a very large boy. <laughs> and Aqua, as we try and stay with him as respectfully as possible, you were saying you would love to ride shotgun. But our seats are always occupied by guidebooks and various other things. At the moment, my current shotgun passenger is a book on insects and my binoculars. And a jacket, an extra jacket, which happens to be Kirsty's actually. I must really return it to her at some point. And a hat. Now those are my current shotgun passenger. Yes, driving with reference books is always a very important part of being a guide. There's always something that you will encounter that you don't know the answer to. All right, we're going to, we're going to get a view of him and then we're going to leave him just because he's clearly not comfortable with our vehicle and it's just going to keep causing him to move further and further away. No, he's on his way. Nope, he's unhappy. We'll just move out of the block and away from him. He's just, he's, whilst he's not going to be aggressive in any way, he's just going to keep moving away from us. There's a nice, not such a clear view. All right, boy. This is what I mean. I think he's a Kruger elephant. He's coming from an area where he's not that familiar with vehicles. He might also be very thirsty and on his way for a drink, of course. That's also a possibility. Oh, he's feeding quite comfortably, but he's got a very clear... There's different zones when you approach an animal. There's the comfort zone. And he's got quite a large comfort zone. His comfort zone is probably about 50 odd meters, so about 150 feet. Oh, we're just going to let him carry on his morning business. Try to ignore the flies that are accompanying him. And Megan, while we leave our elephant, you were wondering about how we learn as much as we do about the bush and the animals and whether or not we have a university degree in it. And the answer is no. In fact, I don't think any of the current guides have a university degree specifically geared towards what we do. And for example, my university degree is or was in law. As you can see, my legal career striving ahead. It went very successfully for me. But learning about it, learning about the world out here and nature out here is very much a matter of time spent and experience. And a, a burning desire to constantly learn more about what it is we're seeing in our world. And the best guys that I've met in the industry have all been They've, they've all been a very wide and diverse range of people. And everyone, Brent, myself, James included, and Scott, and Steph, are all united by this common burning desire to learn more about the world in which we live. And in particular, the bushveld. So whilst you do have to study, you definitely do, and there are set exams that are geared towards learning to be a guide, there are government qualifications that you have to follow. 
most important in my... Why are you making such a noise, Wendy? Let's just try doing that. There we go. Most of it comes in terms of being out and experiencing and just spending as much time as possible in the bush. And bearing in mind, of course, I would love to know how much ground I have covered, how much area I have driven in my time. And I'm sure the same goes for all of the other guides and presenters in this particular company. Hello. Sorry, Megan, distracted by the company of buffalo bulls, some Duggar boys. One standing watching us very quick, very carefully. And then one lying down at the back. And there you go, Megan. A question that you had about the buffalo bulls or buffalo, the way in which buffalo herds work. You said that you always see the males separate from the rest of the breeding herd. Now, that is the two sort of different buffalo social structures that you can encounter. We're looking at the one, which is a group of Duggar boys. We refer to them as, which basically means mud boys. But once they reach a certain age, they become not antisocial, but they do prefer to move away from the company of the herd. You very commonly see them in groups of one or two. I must say, I have seen larger herds of these bachelor males than I have ever seen anywhere else since starting to work on Juma. My record, I think, was somewhere close to 50-odd bachelor males, which is relatively unusual. Usually you see them in sort of twos or threes. I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it's the dams in this region or if the drought is affecting their behavior in some way. Oh, you see the bachelor groups like this. And then, Megan, you'll also get the breeding herd of close to 500 or more odd animals. The biggest herd I've seen recently was easily close to 1,000, spread out over a kilometer, so over half a mile in distance that this herd was spread. And that's a combination of females and their calves, and then a couple of males spread out throughout the herd of a similar age to the ones that we were looking at there. It's just up to the individual buffalo male where they decide to be. I was just listening to that woodpecker. I was hoping he might decide to come out. One of the woodpeck, one of the many woodpecker species potentially. I'll leave my buffalo herd or my buffalo bulls for now. Carry on before it gets too warm towards the hyena den. We'll see if they're active at all. But yes, Megan, there's, there's different combinations of buffalo herd dynamics. A couple of weeks ago, we were seeing relatively small breeding herds. So 100, maybe 200 individuals at a time, which is totally different to the way in which I started at Juma, where we were seeing 500 odd buffalo together in one herd. And I really honestly think that is to do with the drought. Megan, back to your original question about university degrees and how you learn as much as we have about the bush. I'm sort of trying to figure out why Wendy's making such a peculiar sound. I think it's just dust. Uh, what I was actually going to say on that subject is you'd be surprised how much of being a guide revolves around knowledge, not just bush-based, but also to do with, first of all, general knowledge of current events of the world around you, because you cannot host guests, international guests, without knowing something of what is happening in their everyday lives, so that you are able to carry on a conversation that doesn't necessarily revolve around the bush. And we do spend an incredible amount of time out here so that's generally between you know in amongst each other at camp that's generally what our conversation will revolve around but you cannot be restricted to that with various guests in the re oh, that come to visit 
and then mechanical knowledge, soil types, management of an area, occasionally anti-poaching, there are certain jobs where it is required. Megan, it's an absolute pleasure. That is what I don't think we would have nearly the same live safari experience if we couldn't answer questions. I think it would be a very, very different, I don't want to call it a product, it would just be a very different drive if we didn't have the interaction from the viewers. Megan, I'm going to turn that around and say thank you for sending through your questions and your comments. They make our day, they really do. Because a lot of the time you look back and you know that the cameraman basically knows what you're saying or can predict exactly what it is you're going to say. But to hear the reaction from the viewers and to, to know that you're reaching out to people across the globe and that they're thinking about what it is you're saying and that it impacts in some way on people's lives around the world to me is one of the biggest draw cards of these live safaris. Here we go, coming across towards the hyena den. Kimber, and for many others who aren't always able to watch the sunset safari. This den has been exceptionally active. Let's see if we can't find November. I think I see somebody sitting at the entrance to the den. Hopefully the adults are present so that the cubs are out. Good morning. And how are you? Looks like the December twins. This is my other favorite aspect of these live safaris is being able to follow an animal's story as we have with these cubs from birth. You sent almost from birth up until their adulthood. One moment, let's just listen. December twins and November. And now looking back at one of the best hyena sightings I've had was November when he was still very young, imitating that whooping contact call that we were just listening to. Ooh. And November was still barely without spots. <laughs> he was still very tiny and trying to imitate the sounds of the adults. And watching that sort of imitation of adult behavior is also one of the incredible aspects of spending time at the hyena den, whether it's the anal pasting that they do or the whooping contact calls. I was really hoping that these guys might respond to that call. But I think because a female that's just left the den was right here just a few moments ago, I don't think the cubs feel 
inclined to imitate. You can still see the impact that it has on him, though. He is up and listening. Michelle, you were wondering, since with all of the moves, you've lost track a little bit about where we are or of, or of where we are. Yes, we are still close to the Aubrey's Road Den. It's one of those fascinating aspects of the Aubrey's Road choice of hyenas that they seem to go from termite mound to termite mound. I spoke a lot about this when they moved back here and the fact that when we first found this den, and it was actually them and myself um, who found the Aubrey's Road den initially, purely by chance, we were at an elephant sighting and a hyena cub happened to wander in many months ago. And they did exactly the same thing that they've done this time around, which is move from den site to den site within a very small proximity of each other. Or within very close proximity, sorry, not a small, very close proximity of each other, very small area. And I have absolutely no idea why that is. Sorry guys, just listening to the Game Drive channel for a second. guys just chatting about whether or not they've found any tracks for Karula. None of us have, which is astounding. She does seem to move very cryptically. But yes, we are very close to the Aubrey's Road den site. We're about a hundred or so odd meters, probably even less, from their old den. Or are we going to bed? Hmm, maybe not enjoying a little bit of warmth that's coming through now from the rising sun. And I think we arrived with perfect timing because the cubs are planning their bedtime and time to go back into the den. <laughs> Have you got an itch there, little one? This cub actually had a grass stem attached to its nose for the longest time. I'm not sure if any of you saw that. Now Sandra's saying that she loves the cubs, but not too crazy about the adults that give her the chills. Fair enough, Sandra. Everybody has their own perception of the animals out here. Personally, I enjoy all aspects of spotted hyenas, but I can understand what it is about the spotted hyena adults that maybe gives you the chills. There is, I must say, there is a, a very calculating expression that they can form. Thinking about the ways in which they can manipulate us. They have evolved alongside us and particularly evolved living off any of our waste products that we might leave behind. For example, there is a hyena within the camp in which most of our crew live that has learned to come in and attempt to steal a dustbin. Now we've, we, we've now started putting the dustbin inside at night, but this hyena has learned that even if the gate is closed, there are secret ways in. But instead of tipping over the dustbin and risking alerting everybody to its presence within camp, this particular hyena, whichever one it may be, and I don't know which one it is, I think it's one of the sub-adults, just judging by the tracks that move through or that we see the next morning in camp, has learned, and I mean, I'm talking about a dustbin, but this is now something we've changed completely, but I'm talking about a re really big sort of black bin, garbage bin, sorry, a trash bin or a garbage bin, that it's learned, instead of tipping it over, to drag outside, so outside of the camp, so that it doesn't make too much of a noise when it does decide to tip it over. And it took us a long time to catch on to a way in which to stop this from happening. It's because the hyenas are so clever in the way in which they 
attempt to scavenge the various leftovers. But this hyena was dragging the entire garbage bin that must have been twice its height, probably more than twice its height, outside before making a noise by tipping it over. And that to me is also a very clear sign of intelligence. So I can understand how one might find hyenas a little bit confusing in the way in which they work. They've all gone to bed now. <laughs> Siberia Zumi, I think you've got a good plan. Oh, there's one of them lying off at the back. The sub-adults getting a little bit too big for the hyena den burrows itself. Siberia Zumi would like the hyena whoop as his ringtone. I like that idea. I feel as though I've missed an opportunity to do that. Perhaps next time we get a hyena whooping very close to the car, you'll be able to record it and set it as your ringtone. Although I'm sure there are plenty of examples on the internet that you could probably get hold of. It's, my fav it's one of my favorite sounds of <clears throat> the African bush, is that low contact call. And when you get them calling right next to you or close to you, you really get an impression of the first part of that call, which you don't really hear. As soon as they're a couple of meters away, you don't hear it. But that initial growling stage, it's almost like a lion's roar, that initial It's awesome. It vibrates right through your chest. And I think we're probably going to move out now that the cubs have gone to bed. There's two hyenas lying up. I'm not sure at this distance which ones they are. Fair enough, Sandra, totally fair enough. Sandra said that she's seen so many videos of them ripping animals apart and even killing lions. It's one of those interesting aspects, and I think a lot of our opinions of animals are influenced by popular culture. Generally, hyenas as hunters, rather than as scavengers, actually kill their prey faster than a lion do, uh, faster than lions do. And I mean, I've seen lions, we had a sighting with James not too long ago, and I've had a sighting very recently with Nikki and Kirsty, where we went out looking for the lions and we found them hunting buffalo where it's taken them, particularly with small prey that they know can't escape them or can't hurt them, that they basically essentially started eating alive because they don't bother with the, to, to suffocate the animal first. And that is incredibly brutal. But animals not, of course, governed by our moral compass in the same way that we view animals and animal suffering. And it's very difficult for us to watch a sighting like that. So hyenas generally, kill generally same as wild dogs although it's something that people perceive as very brutal it's quite often faster than the way in which lions and leopards kill Karula, for example had that baby daker that she kept alive and in shock for a very long time i don't know why she did it um, it's something that cats do in the same way it's something that all predators do many of you will have domestic cats at home that will very often bring you half dead animals back whether they be rodents or birds and is one of those brutal aspects that we don't necessarily understand but there's a reason for the way in which animals do that and hyenas yes they'll kill lions and I've, I actually saw a male lion kill seven or eight hyena in one go it was one of the most brutal things I've ever witnessed but I completely understand where you're coming from it's just a perception of the way in which the animals behave. And I, I think that, I honestly think that the popular representation has played a huge way, a huge role. Here we go. Aqua's just saying, as we get to the point where we're going to leave the hyena den, Aqua's saying that she has succumbed to the enchantment of the spotted hyena and that Safari Live has given her a different perspective because yes, very often documentaries I think do fall into that trap of picking a side, whether it be, whether it be the lions or the spotted hyenas and representing, whenever you see interactions with the different predators, there's always 
the main character and then the antagonists. That's the way our brains work. That's the way we relate to stories. Um, definitely nobody at fault. But the one nice thing about our Safari Live drives is that it is live and it's unscripted. So what's happening is what we show you. And it can be brutal. We've had hyena fights where they have torn into each other and ripped ears and feet and it's very very difficult for us to watch but there's always a reason behind what it is we do and we don't necessarily under understand exactly what that reason might be now that it's light and the sun has come up a little bit above the horizon i'm going to go back to where i had karula last night i'm going to see if i can't figure out which direction our sneaky favorite leopard has decided to go in just to figure out as i said this morning where she might be denning while I do that, let's find out how Brent's search is going. So, an update on those tracks we're following that was shut out. Uh, they're headed into a drainage system, uh, and it looks like a good place for a den. So I stopped tracking her there, moved out, because those cubs will be, if they are cubs, a month old. So I don't want to put any pressure on, the, on, on where she's possibly got a den. So we've left the area completely, and uh, We've come to go see if we can find Karula and uh, see if she's caught anything overnight. So both her and Shadow were hunting last night when we found them. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like either of them caught anything. Well, Shadow definitely uh, didn't from where we found her tracks. So let's go see if we can find Karula. So we said, say heading into the center of Juma. Quarantine's just over there. And so she was seen around there. I'm going to go check a little bit wider, see if she went down towards the Mawati Riverbed. But other than that, it's been really quiet out there, both on the radio and in what we're seeing. Thank you. 